Good morning and welcome to you all. Um, we have been absolutely delighted to see the large turnout and interest in these live webinars. Um, my name is Isla Shaliri from the Graduate Business School in Griffith College. And we have a pretty packed agenda today, so we're going to get started um, very, very soon. Just to advise you, the chat function is not turned on simply because of the large volume of participants in this webinar. So if you have any queries or questions at any stage, you can do that through the Q&A function, which is being moderated throughout this webinar. The Q&A function, if you ask a question, is private. No other participants can see it. In the main, we won't be answering any questions live because of the number of speakers we have today and to make sure that we manage to get as much content in as possible. However, any of the questions that you ask through the Q&A function will be addressed by all of our speakers over the next two to three days and made available as podcasts and documents on our website. So please do ask questions as the, as the webinar progresses. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over for a short welcome address from Neil MacDonald, who is Chief Executive of ISME. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me loud and clear. Um, where we are today, where we are this morning, and where you and your businesses are this morning is bad. Uh, there is no point in pretending it's otherwise. And the situation we're in today is arguably worse than it was 10 years ago in terms of the rapidity uh, that this crisis has moved throughout our economy with. Today, however, is about being positive and thinking about what the environment is going to look like after this crisis passes, as it will pass. Beyond that, we're also trying to think about how you can adapt your business to that environment that exists after COVID-19 passes. And what I would like you to do uh, before these fine series of webinars commences is to think uh, and remember what those disruptors and early movers did in similar circumstances 10 years ago. It is possible for you and your business uh, to, to take similar actions, to move in the same way as those early movers, those disruptors did 10 years ago. And so this morning, it's my job to thank Tomas, all the staff in Griffith College and all the lecturers that they've assembled uh, to deliver this series of webinars to you. The very best of luck to you. And I really hope you take something positive and some good learnings from this. Thank you and I'll hand back to Eilish. Thank you very much, Neil. And we'll now have a short welcome from Tomas McGuckagon, Academic Director at Griffith College. Hello and welcome to Griffith College, Dublin, Cork and Limerick. I'm afraid not in physical campuses anymore, but coming online. I hope that you, your families and your friends are safe and well. Thanks for choosing and arranging your day today to join us. It's a huge privilege and responsibility for us to take this time and to use it wisely as best we can on your behalf. We know your time is precious and we want these sessions to be as valuable as they possibly can. I'd like to thank ISMI, Neil, Adam and Kieran, their team for their huge support in spreading this message and making it possible. They've invited their members and they've guided us on what needed. We've worked with them for 10 years and we know through them what is valued. We've a certificate and they've taught us what's required, relevant, practical, valuable, and realistic guidance. They know that we know that they don't like philosophical, academic, or theoretical dissertations and discussions about the same. We're dealing with a crisis. We know it's a nightmare. I'd like to thank the external speakers from all across the country. Today, Nick, Catherine, Stephen, and Naomi for getting stuck in and giving everybody a hand. They're the real experts. They know what's required and what's best practice. I'd like to thank them for doing them willingly, enthusiastically and voluntarily. It's wonderful to have their experience today. I'd like to thank Eilish and the Graduate Business School, Anya, Michael and all the team for just getting stuck in and reimagining what we can do in the period of about a week since Ismi and ourselves sat down and said, really, what can we do? What's the best? So thank you for reimagining what we can do. I'd like to thank the college's 
wider marketing team and the IT team who've got the story out and who are managing the various technical issues that we're all trying to deal with. We know it's tough. We're a business ourselves. We know that people have very more real concerns as well, possibly about the health and safety of those they love. Here we're a Griffith, we're a business, Griffith College, and we know we're very lucky to be in a position to stay open, at least in much of what we do. So we know that we've been given good odds there in that sense. We know that many businesses have much greater challenges to face in the immediate before they can reopen when they're not allowed to practice today and will be held for a week or two or a few weeks. However, the good news is, and we've all seen it, is Ireland's commitment to fixing this has been huge. Government agencies have never acted like they're doing now. The phone calls of support from everybody to everybody have been phenomenal. And what was impossible years ago somehow now seems not only possible but simple to achieve. Our take on things at the moment is that we're going to come through this as a country with all our businesses. Ireland Inc. wants to keep everybody on board and to back us up so we're back on track running quickly. We know we'll have to adapt our businesses and not everything will be as it was. But there is a silver lining and that is possibly for the first time SME managers might get a chance to pause and think to reimagine their business and with the help of experts design what they want to do when the business returns and the world has slightly changed. There's never been a better opportunity to learn new skills and to come together as you restart and come back stronger. Griffith College is delighted to be part of this. And finally, most importantly, thank you again for your time. I'll be leaving shortly because I want to come in as a, an observer <clears throat> rather than a participant in this sense. But please stay safe and well. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas, and thank you, Neil, for those lovely welcomes and introductions. So like I said, we have a packed agenda. We've lined up for the first um, seminar, some key speakers in what we think are the most crucial areas for you um, in the here and now today. So the first two speakers are going to speak to enabling remote working. So I am delighted to introduce Nick Aikman, who is managing director or channel sales manager at 8x8, um, who is going to start our keynotes. Thanks, Alish. I think I can, uh, I can see the first slide on there now. Thanks for the promotion. Great. I've gone up to managing director roles, so uh, that's fantastic. <laughs> must, must do more of this homeworking, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, morning, everybody. Thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, come and speak today. And if we can have the next slide, please, Eilish. Okay, that's great. I think that's my, uh, my intro slide on there, Eilish. So, uh, yeah, frightening to see that I've been a, a remote uh, or homeworker for the last 18 years. But, uh, yeah, if we can uh, perhaps move on to the next slide, that'd be great. So what we've uh, we've got on uh, screen here is a little bit of a walk through the sort of typical things that you might see uh, with employees working and, and living from everywhere. And I think that's that's the key thing. Clearly, what we're we're going through at the moment is is exceptional circumstances, and I think we're hearing that everywhere with with COVID nineteen. And clearly, hope all yourselves and your families are, are keeping as well as possible in these these very strange circumstances. So. My section today was really just about giving some ideas and some tips about how our remote working, um, or perhaps as we will see as we go through, really trying to refer to that as distributed working because remote working can have different implications in it. So that's probably the first tip straight from the top is to say, try and try not to use the term remote. I will as we go through because it, it's relevant in some cases, but it's best, best practice not to do that because sometimes that'll give the impression that some employees are essential and some employees are not. So if somebody starts saying I'm remote, it means I'm remote from the business. I'm not as important as people who are based in the office. Clearly, as we're all in a sort of lockdown situation at the moment, we're all working from somewhere that's not normal. But as Thomas has said, we'll come out of this and people will start to look at what, what does a distributed workforce mean. But what it should do is it should put everybody on an equal playing field. I think the key to success in this is, is, is having a very conscious approach to it. And it's fair to say that talents and intelligence are, are equally distributed throughout the world, but opportunity isn't necessarily. So having someone in the right location often brings with it the right knowledge and the right skills that aren't always found where, let's say, the headquarters are. 
And this can be equally true whether you're running a single country like Ireland or throughout the UK, or as we say, a global footprint company. Just because somebody's got headquarters in Dublin or in San Francisco or in Liverpool, where I'm based, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of the skills are all held in that place just because the, the business is based there. So having a distributed workforce is, is certainly something we've seen gathering a, a, a greater pace as, as time goes on. And the core to that is looking at that distributed workforce and the desire and the culture to give people an amount of, of autonomy over, over how they work. So unless you're in a role where very specific hours are important and everyone can make, uh, make their own schedule and make their own times and everybody gets that corner office, everybody gets a window seat, everyone can decide how hot it is in their house or how cold it is, they can have a window open, they can have it noisy, they can have it quiet. It's building that sort of trust that just because somebody's a distributed worker doesn't mean that they're sat around all day watching daytime television. I think that's something that people have moved past years ago. You know, home workers, remote workers, distributed workforce tends to be actually a far more productive workforce. But how can it be looked at from a from let's say a technology company because everyone says well it works well for you how does it work for, for, for other people and what, what are some of the key things to go through and we'll, we'll go through that as we progress through the slides but one thing I would certainly say is try and document everything. Office working means it, it's very easy to, to make decisions in the office, in the hallways, by the water coolers, by the copier machines and the printers because you've had a meeting you've come out of it and then you're carrying on those discussions. If somebody is remote from the office in a distributed workforce, they, they're not parties of those discussions and can feel left out and can get that sort of disconnected feel. And you, you might be feeling that now with the, the COVID-19 situation that we're going through. So with that in mind, I'd say it's always good to leave some form of a, a documentation trail, something that shows what decisions and what discussions have been made. Uh, without that in understanding, employees will feel left out and they'll, they won't know the why. Why was that decision made? Uh, what was what was the point of that? So it's good practice for companies operating across multiple time zones to do that, multiple countries to do it, where employees can pick up work that other ones have left behind. So if it's a support environment, for example, um, and somebody's gone home or they've logged off effectively, it can be picked up in another country in another time zone. If they've got the documentation, they can see where that's at. Even having things like we, we use it internally with chat rooms, and you can see, um, on the screens that we've got now, we can have things like chat, so you can put them into, into specific rooms against that. Certainly finding the right tools and experimenting with, with what is right for you is, is key to this. There are hundreds of apps. We're, we're on, I think it's Zoom today. My own company, 8x8, has its own version of this. It's experimenting what's right and what enables you to collaborate and communicate, see what works best what is right for one business is not necessarily the blueprint for every business so so try it play around with it see what works lots of these things uh, zoom included our own included there are trials you can try these things and some employees will, will pick certain elements of some love video some prefer to have it not on some just like the chat engines in it again it, it, it's what works best for for you and your businesses and your employees and then I think the final practice is, is giving people that flexibility uh, to make their own home environment. So whether that's through budgets or stipends, towards setting up their home environment. And that, that can be everything from the, the chairs they sit in, the monitors they use, make sure they have the right PC equipment. That, as employees, uh, they need that. You've got to provide that as an employee. And everything should be exactly the same as it would be if it was in an office environment. So make sure that that's set up in a way that makes them the most productive that they, they can be. And I said, there's certainly a distributed workforce movement. Um, I think at the moment it's probably 20% of the market force. I think you'll find over the next two decades that that's gonna flip around to being where most people realize they can work from home. Certainly what we're going through at the moment is very telling. You know, Most people have found that they can work from home if it's clearly not a, a, an operation or a manufacturing type of role. I think we're gonna see far more demand of people saying, you know what, it worked absolutely fine. How can we do this? How can we, we roll this out across the business? So that's what we're sort of gonna, gonna look at. If we can have the next slide on there, please, Eilish. So these were, were some of the key things that we, we had 
when we looked at what were the challenges from this remote distributed working. And I need us to say that the top one out of that is going to be top with communication. So getting up to 30% of people mentioning that their biggest challenge was when working distributed from the office, how do they communicate? So yes, we can all pick up a phone, whether that's a desk based or a mobile phone, but you don't get to see body language. You don't get to hear what people are saying. You don't necessarily get to ask those follow up questions, as we mentioned, you know, post meetings. Um, it's not so easy to walk around and ask a coworker for clarification at their desk because you might be hundreds or, or thousands of miles away from them. So it, it's building in those best practices. So how do you get that communication equal across the whole business? It, it's probably a good point to sort of say if, if one person is a, is a remote worker, then you should treat it like everybody is a remote worker. So making sure that that communication is, is a two way street. Everybody is informed. That, that's probably the way, certainly as eight by eight, that's how we look at it. Nobody is, is treated any differently, whether they're office based or home based. I think social opportunities comes up and that, that can mean many things to, to many people, but lacking social opportunities tended to be the challenge uh, or cited by a lot of the participants that, that were, were surveyed on this. Um, and of course, office culture doesn't exist when there isn't an office or you're not in an office or you're feeling left out. But so that, that's why people, tend to struggle with, with some of the social opportunities. So whether it's grabbing drinks with co-workers or being involved in certain clubs or meetings, it's build those in. They can be done just as easily, generally speaking, just as easily remotely as they can be in person. So again, it, it's build those social um, aspects into it. You know, make people call in. It doesn't always just have to be, I'm only communicating because there's a, a specific work task. It's get that social responsibility built into it as well. Uh, not something I particularly sort of suffer myself, the next biggest one in there, I won't go through all of these points, but loneliness uh, and isolation, I must just be happy with my own company, I guess, but it is a challenge and some people will find that a struggle. You might be finding that as we're three, four weeks into a, uh, a lockdown now. Um, sitting at home alone day after day can leave you sapped of energy and feeling down. It's just trying to get that company feeling again as, as leaders it's making sure that you're leading from the front you're communicating just as regularly if not more regularly when people are in that, that distributed uh, environment without that people will start to switch off and will become less productive we can have the next slide on there please Irish. So looking at some of the, the best practice and the next two slides will, will, will cover this off and uh, I've, I've purposely gone through the remotely to try and force everybody to say don't don't use the word remote because it does just give that feeling of what do you mean remote remote from what it's distributed workforce so look at good practice uh, and uh, etiquette within meetings I think we've seen some of that today um, in terms of, of how you approach them um, we've touched on the idea of experimenting with what makes you as individuals more productive and you as businesses more productive uh, do document just because we can use video and we can use chat just make sure everyone's aware of where that resides um, again sort of relaying to my own experiences I've, I've been with 8x8 for I think it's around about six months now and it does take a little bit of time to get into the culture and we, we very much use our chat engines far more than we do emails so if you want to find out specific things about the product there are chat rooms that you can go into and find that but if you're not told about them, you don't know they're there. So again, it, it makes the communications nice and clear. Something that comes up time and time again is, is the boundaries between work and home life. And I, I probably do struggle with that one a little bit. It's very easy to start in the morning. It's not so easy to switch off uh, because you're at home. You haven't got that click that says work's finished. I need to get in the car, go and get the bus, go and get the train and head home. You're already home. So it, it's making sure people have got those boundaries of, of what's reasonable and, and sensible and best practice to, to do that. Being visible, again, as someone that's um, 18 plus years working from home, you, you can hide if you wanted to. Uh, you don't want people doing that. You want them to be as much a part of the organization as somebody that's in the office five days a week. So it, it is making sure that they are seen, whether that is on video calls like we're, we're doing today, um, they're in meetings, they're much a part of it as everybody else. And that's also down to the employees themselves. They've got to be 
sensible about this and not just treat it as I'm not in the office so I don't have to communicate with people. You do. It's to get that sort of visibility uh, built in. You've covered socialising, connecting with your team. So I'm part of a team of 12 people and we're talking all day, every day and sharing experiences. Um, I'd say pretty much all of us, 90% of that, that team are, are home-based. So we, we do have that communication. It does work because we cover different parts of, uh, of the country. So that's how it works best for us. It, it's keeping the team connected. Our leader, he's very, very instrumental in that and make sure it, it, it runs as smoothly as possible. Sounds very uh, morbid, but doing post-mortems on key projects. I think that's still key. Uh, so if you treat the whole remote or distributed working as a, as a project, keep going back, keep digging into what's working and, and what works well and what works well for certain departments and not others. Again, as I say, you experiment, best practice around it. Just because the IT department really works well with this product doesn't mean that the HR department or the sales department will be the same. So keep doing those post-mortems on those key projects and make sure it, it works properly against it. And I'll have to sort of build accountability and define your team's responsibilities very much around the idea of, again, just because somebody is, is distributed or the team is distributed, it doesn't mean that they're less accountable and you as a team leader uh, needs to ignore them because they're okay, they work from home, they're fine. You get that responsibility. It's your responsibility as leaders to make sure that those people are are content and happy and back to the sort of the previous slide with what are the sort of main issues that come up make sure that they're, they're comfortable in their, their environment so if we have the next slide please uh, Irish so this one sort of follows along with the, the same um, idea on this one in terms of what makes good uh, meetings as we've seen today you know we're all a little bit new to this so it, it's making sure that everything works and check that out first I, I'd certainly say if you're having it face-to-face -face meetings then switch the video on clearly when you're doing something like this we've all decided to have the video switched off because it's distracting you know, if you're presenting something you really want what you're presenting on the screen and not what's happening with all the people around you and, and there's there's huge amounts of information around what you, you should do first probably is test the technology. Open the app ahead of time. We've done that today. We've, we've followed absolute best practice. Check your software updates. Do a test call. Make sure everything's working, everything's kosher. Check your camera works and your microphone. We've all done that. We've had some issues and hopefully they'll all, all work fine as we, we go through the session. Nothing is going to look more amateur to your customers and your employees than running late while somebody's got a 2009 MacBook that reboots with a new Zoom update and security updates whilst they're trying to log into a video conference and, and everyone's yelling, can you hear me now? And we've all joined meetings where everyone says that and you think, no, you've got your microphone on mute. So practice it, make sure everyone can, can see it. A fairly obvious thing that look nice. Uh, it doesn't mean that you need to dress in your suit, but it means not appearing in your pajamas or with your bathrobe. Most people tend to work in a, a sort of a, a low res environment, if you like, on that. So it's a good time to come in, make sure you're well presented. Treat it like you're in the office. Just because you're remote, distributed on a video call, doesn't mean that you have to appear any differently. So, so keep it neat, keep it clean. Take some pride in your, or, or your appearance. It, it, it's that etiquette again. Keep that etiquette uh, up to, as up to date and as professional as you, you possibly can. So uh, again, it, it's probably a bit like TV. Keep sort of fussy patterns on tops, colours, reds, blacks, whites. They don't look good on cameras. Don't wear anything too wacky. Again, it, it just won't come through. Keep it simple, whites, blues, pastels. That tends to work better, as it probably does in real life, if we're being honest. Uh, backgrounds, you can see on, on some applications, you can change your background, but uh, you know, a boho hotel room wall or your, your bedroom or your office, wherever you're working from, um, is fine. But if you've got things like crowded bookshelves with a few personal knickknacks on there with little bits of stuff that everybody will be drawn to that. So if you're presenting and you've got something quite busy going on behind you, they're now switching off and zooming in and trying to see what books you've got and what your CDs and your DVDs, if you've still got those sorts of things. It's just be very careful what's on show. You know, if there's any silly magic eye posters in the background, um, ransom notes that have been written in blood on pictures of people behind you, it's not ideal. Keep it as plain and simple as you can. Think about the lighting. 
If you've got windows in front of you, um, you're going to look like something off crime prevention. Just make sure it's lit, people can see you. Um, people prefer not to be in a kind of a cave dwelling environment, so you get lots of echo going around. Try different microphones. If you've got ones that came with your mobile phone, they're probably fine, they'll, they'll work fine. If you've got headphones, what we're using today, again, it, it can look a little, bit, a little bit brighter, a little bit clearer against it. Uh, and it's working through just making sure your camera is on. Uh, it's judgment call, how you do that. Not, not everybody is comfortable doing it. I think as we're going through this sort of pandemic at the moment, more and more people are switching to it. As we, we've been in the business of doing this for years, internally switched more from having people that have the camera off and just have it as audio to far more of us now have the camera on. So just, just make sure that you've got that decision, say how you're going to do it and work, work through. Um, as we used to say, look them in the eye, well, look them in the lens now. So uh, a secret to the video calls is looking into the camera, which is the equivalent of looking at somebody if you were in a meeting with them. So that's how you should appear um, at the other end. For that reason, it's advisable to position a camera uh, where it's as natural as you can, keep it maybe slightly above you or directly in front. Generally speaking, you shouldn't have it below you. Um, you don't need to be looking at it all times. Clearly, like now I'm, I'm presenting, I'll be looking at the, the slide where against it if you're presenting spreadsheets or other information it's understandable that you're not going to be staring down the lens all the time and i'm sure some of you will be doing this now but don't submit to things like um, distractions if you like so as we've got on there don't fiddle with the phone don't work on other things um, particularly if it's an audio only conference yeah okay it's okay to stand up and walk around the room but you shouldn't be fidgeting with your phone particularly if you're on camera everyone's going to see that you you're doing it so make sure that you're not distracted um, if you are typing and you've got your microphone on we've all got our switched off typically your keyboard is going to be one of the nearest things to the microphone that you've got and it hammers through you can hear people typing away you would also hear it is that's doing it clearly they're not paying attention to the presentation that's going on so just be mindful about the distractions that are around you. Treat it as if you are in, in work. It's sort of IRL gets used now is in real life. That's one of the buzzwords that's coming out of it. So uh, a video call can do pretty much everything that an, an in real life in-person meeting can do um, without sort of some of the difficulties, of course, are, are managing large groups. So it is gonna be much harder to do that. So again, it's back to that etiquette and for that reason. You know, it, it's probably a good idea to have, you know, three or four people that are going to sort of structure the meeting and keep it uh, monitored. Make sure everybody joins, perhaps a video on, but microphone off. That's generally standard sort of settings on on most systems to be able to to do that. You can have hand raising policy. This tool allows us to do it, so everyone can be silent. You click a, an icon and it raises a hand, and that indicates somebody wants to speak. So, so use the technology. Back to that experiment with with what's happening for it. And then the final bit on that one, I think really is it's just don't forget that the microphone and camera are on, especially perhaps when meetings are over. Just because somebody's dropped off doesn't mean everybody's dropped off. I've seen too many instances where people start talking about things that they perhaps shouldn't be, not realizing that the microphone is still on or the camera's still on, or it's still recording. You start saying things that you really wish you hadn't. Just be careful. A lot of these calls, this one included, are, are recorded so people can play it back. The beauty of this sort of thing, of course, is people who aren't able to make it can view it later on. So just be mindful about what you're saying pre and post. If there's a warm up period before the actual meeting starts and post it, make sure you've cleared down, make sure you, you be clear of what's being said. If we can have the next slide, please, sir. Nice. So this one's about time and time being the, the sort of the, the the biggest resource that we've all got. So um, again, sort of just touching on what I've done throughout my, my home working, remote uh, distributed career, if you like, is it, it's, it's make sure that you do have that start and end time. I'm guilty of the end time bit. It, it is too easy to run over, but again, it, it's looking after your employees uh, as, as managers of businesses, making sure that they are not working and working and working. Whilst that might sound great, it really isn't great for them. So blocking out the time. If possible, having a very specific place where you can work. I know that's not, not necessarily easy for everybody, but trying to set up every day on the kitchen table and then every morning you come down, you've got to plug the PC back in, you've got to put the phone if you have a physical phone there. 
it's not ideal you know it's it's also going to be where you're going to get interrupted very very easily so if you can create a space where you work from do it switch off phone notifications i'd say certainly during meetings like this yes i've done that but again as a as a remote worker you know switch things off get a certain time of night just switch off otherwise it's too tempting just to keep walking back in and and re-picking up that thing and work and work and work there's a time where you need to stop so leave the laptop in a dedicated workspace is again ideal i i do that i'm based up in the attic in my house so it's way too far to go and get that anyway so for me that works the last one might might sound odd but using props i've actually done it today so i'm, I'm sat i'm wearing shoes i'm not going out uh, anywhere today but just doing things like putting a pair of shoes on putting a proper shirt on just signals to, to your brain that we're working we're not sort of sat at home with our pajamas on, back to that idea, or sat with our nice warm fluffy slippers on. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes, like today, it's an important presentation to come and give to, to yourselves. It's get your mind into that way of thinking. So whether it's, for me, it's, it's putting a pair of shoes on, uh, other people, it, it might just be getting dressed in a slightly different way than they would uh, when they know they're not doing any kind of uh, video call. So again, it's just little props like that, I'd say from an individual, uh, point of view just work through that way then if we have the, the next slide please Harish. and then pretty much just to, to sort of finish up on uh some of the the stats we, we kind of covered some of these but you probably find in some of these already if you're now sort of three or four weeks into this lockdown the biggest struggle with with working remotely so certainly is that unplugging after work so for yourselves and for your employees it's making sure that they are not sort of working way beyond where they should be say so loneliness not something I've, I've had an issue with but as leaders it's follow best practice make sure you're in in constant contact with them more than you had been if you're in the office in the office you've got that opportunity just to walk by the desks you don't have that when people are, are working in a distributed workforce so make sure you're checking in with them more often than, than you would have done previously to that and we talked about collaborating and, and communicating uh, and this idea of, of, of socializing to give you some idea. I don't know if anybody uses Strava. Strava is a free app you can use for uh, whether it's cycling or running, and, and people can join in. And we've got an 8x8 Strava club. So we've got a chat room on that using our tools. So again, we can all see who's been out running and riding and encouraging people to get out once a day. We've got a leaderboard. I think there's 20 odd of us uh, throughout the UK and Ireland that are on that. And we can all monitor it and we just have that chat. And it just gives that socializing point that we've got and it, it's minutes a day if that so it's not something people are sat there spending hours on it just makes you feel more of a team whether that's your actual your work day your day-to-day -day team or in my case some of them are from that some of them are from completely different parts of the business that I wouldn't have known before but now I know them because we've got this collaboration and communication tool that enables us to to work that way and then things like distractions from home, I think they're fairly obvious ones. It, it's too easy if you've got children running around. Obviously, everybody's got that at the moment, but once we're through this, hopefully they'll be back at school. You don't have that, but whether it's TVs or wandering out, just try and reduce the distractions as, as best you can. You know, you, you're working, you need to put the, the time in. You know, you don't have to be a slave to it. Um, you hear too many stories about people receiving emails and responding to them straight away because they feel if they don't do that, that their manager's thinking, oh, Nick's, Nick's slacking off because he didn't respond to that within five minutes. People don't think that. Get on with your work in the way you should do, and you respond to emails and texts and that in as timely a fashion as you would do if you're in the office. So don't feel that lack of physical visibility is, is going to be a, 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 a hold back on that, if you like. The other points I think you could kind of go through for yourself on there, so I won't, uh, I won't cover all of those off. So if you have the next, which I, and I think last slide, I was on that, I won't. Uh, Steal uh, Stephen Mackerel's thunder on this one because he's going to tell you how you can go about uh, getting the free videos meeting solution through the, the worker website. So I'll, I'll leave most of that to Steve, but just as a, a finish on that one, we, we launched this back in November last year um, and we had reasonable take up on it. And it, why not? Because it's free. It's doing pretty much what we're doing today, it gives you the option to do free video meetings. Uh, but since the pandemic, so in the last three weeks, it's gone from 1.2 million subscribers per month uh, i checked this morning we're now at 8.2 million users of this across 168 countries so 
you can see the amount of distributed workforce is, is going up and up and up and tools like this are becoming vital. So I'd certainly um, urge you to, to, if you get the chance, take a look at that um, and Stephen can help you out with it, which I think brings me to the end of my slot and I'll hand you back to Irish. Thank you so much, Nick. I'm just going to leave that slide up there for a few more seconds in case anybody wants to get the details, but we will be sharing this information on our website as well. Yeah. Thanks, Eilish. So thank you, Nick. Those were really interesting insights. I will confess I'm wearing slippers at the moment, so I... Uh, need to start taking your advice a bit more <laughs> seriously. Um, and we're going to move on to our next speaker, who is also going to talk to remote working and looking at some of the practical um, considerations as you do that. And that is Stephen Mackerel, who is Managing Director at WorkAir. So you're very welcome, Stephen. I'm going to just set up your presentation now. Uh, thank you very much, Eilish. Uh, I suppose in the interest of speed, I'll keep talking while you're setting up the slide. Okay. Uh, a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm a chartered director with the Institute of Directors uh, in Dublin. Um, I'm a board member for a number of different companies. New Measured Power being one of them. Penergy is the one of the trade names there. Uh, Credit Exchange and Kefron Holdings. Uh, I'm also I'm former CEO of Carphone Warehouse Ireland. I brought Carphone to Ireland back in the late '90s, so um, brought it from basically an unknown startup to um, to I suppose a household brand name really. So. Um, and I'm currently CEO of Work Air Limited. So, Eilish, if you could just share the, yeah, that's perfect. Um, if you're on to the next slide, um, there are a couple of companies you would have heard Nick talk about 8x8 or 8x8, and uh, you'll hear about Work Air. So, who are 8x8 and who are Work Air? So, Work Air is the company that I am CEO of. Uh, we're an Irish company, we're the only specialized cloud communications provider in Ireland. And we're the agents for a number of the largest cloud communications providers across the world, including 8x8. And, and, and we're, 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 we're a key partner for 8x8 in Ireland. And um, 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 some of our clients include um, FreeNow, who, you, who were formerly Halo, My Taxi, Nissan, you'd be, you'd be aware of, Six, uh, the leasing company, um, Windsor Group, SalesSense, um, I could go on. Um, 8x8 are the leader of cloud communications worldwide and virtual contact centers worldwide. Um, they're a New York stock exchange listed company and they're a Gartner Magic Quadrant company for the last eight years. Many of you will never have heard of 8x8. Have a look at www.8x8.com. They are the best in the world at what they do. And um, uh, I said they're a public limited company or they're a publicly quoted company and they're a Gartner Magic Quadrant company. So you are dealing with a very reputable company, you know, revenues in excess of $400 million a year, market capitalization, of, well, market capitalizations are fluctuating quite a bit in, over the last couple of weeks, but the market cap is kind of a, a, um, well north of a billion US dollars. Um, just want to move to the next slide there, Eileen, please. Eileen, please, sorry. Um, so just when we're talking about uh, what does cloud-based communications, or UCAAS is the term that you may come across. Uh, UCAAS is Unified Communications as a Service, and CCAAS is Contact Center as a Service. Basically what that means is your, your, your communications products in the cloud. But what does that mean? Um, if you look at Unified Communications, the product that we are, um, that have been very successful for us in Ireland is called Virtual Office. And what does that mean? That means basically under the one uh, app or, or the one piece of software on your PC or on your mobile phone, you get uh, your traditional phone system capabilities. So your office phone systems like an auto attendant or an IVR as we know about it, you know, press one for sales, press two for service. You know, you get your call queues, your ring group. So the functionality that you would expect from a top class business phone system is included in virtual office. You also under the same uh, license you get virtual meetings and video conferencing. Um, so that's uh, high definition video and secure video conferencing, which includes screen share and call recording. And um, the other thing that's included under uh, a unified communications platform is messaging. So some of you may be familiar with Slack or WhatsApp is probably the best known consumer messaging app. But uh, this is business messaging where you get one to one or group messaging. Um, instant messaging to everybody in the industry or, or in your business where you can 
um, share documents, you can, you can communicate with each other, you can share images, etc., all instantly. And then mobility is hugely important. You can deploy um, a, a virtual office on a laptop, on a tablet, on a mobile phone, or you can have a traditional phone on your desk. And um, the last thing that a virtual office allows you to do is you get full detailed analytics of, you know, who's calling into the business, the missed calls, your unreturned calls, et cetera, et cetera. So you get very good information about how your, con your customers are choosing to contact you. And the contact center is the next level up. So this is the traditional call center. And what this allows you to do, a virtual call center or CCAAS, contact center as a service, um, basically gives you the, full, the same functionality as virtual office plus you get contact center functionality, which includes what we call multi-channel. So a customer can choose to contact you on the phone, on email, via a chat, or via different forms of social media like Facebook, chat, uh, Twitter, etc. And the virtual contact center basically brings all those contacts from a customer into the one place. So you can actually have a single view of the customer. And that's hugely important moving forward where customers expect to be able to contact you via the channel that they choose or they prefer. But if they choose to contact you on email one day, maybe in a message the next day and on call the third day, they expect you to be able to see, oh yeah, we saw your email there. We, we can see your email. We can see your instant message. We can see your chat. There's nothing more irritating than ringing up a utility generally to say, here, I was on the phone to you yesterday, I sent you an email the other day, and you've got to go through the whole process again. So what Virtual Contact Center does, pulls all those channels together, you get a single view of the customer. You also get quality management and workflow management, and that's all about optimizing a contact center. I'm not going to spend too much time on this one because it's probably not as relevant today. You also get advanced analytics, so you get the, the nuts and bolts data that you need to run a contact center. Um, uh, effectively. So that's what, and of course, all this is held up in the cloud. So the only way you need to access any of this stuff is uh, with a very good broad or with a good broadband connection. You don't need expensive servers. You don't need expensive cabling, etc. And that's what enables people to work remotely. Once you have broadband, you can access all these functions at anywhere in the world. Um, Elish, if you could just move on to the next slide, please. Um, so what does this look like? This is a snapshot of the, uh, piece, the, the piece of software, the app that's on my phone. If you can see, that's a very disgruntled looking uh, myself. Um, but if you see on the left hand side, in the one place, you can see there's a, uh, first of all, there's a little caption of me with a little green dot on it. That's to tell everybody in the business that I am available, I'm present, I'm at my desk, I'm ready to take calls. Um, so you can see who's in, who's active or whatever, anywhere in the business. The next one down below that is the, uh, the, the magnifying glass. That's the search option. You can search your contacts, et cetera. You can skip the next one. The one below that, the telephone is, if I want to access my phone, I click on that and it'll pop up a dial pad for me and I can call anybody or I can call people from my contacts. The icon below that is contacts so I can access my contacts. I can pull contacts in from Office, from, from Google, from wherever I have contacts, from my mobile phone. And you also have all the company contacts in there. Um, the icon below that is your access to your instant messaging. The icon below that is your access to your meetings. So you click on that and it gives you three clicks. You're into, you, you've got a full virtual meeting set up or a virtual conference set up. Below that is your fax functionality and below that is your recordings functionality. The purpose of this slide is just to show you that in one place and at the click of a switch, I can access my phone, I can access my instant messaging. I can access my meetings, I can access my facts, I can access my call recordings, I can see who's available in the business. And the big advantage of this over many other uh, uh, options is that sometimes you know, people say, well, well, I have Teams for meetings and I have Zoom for my conferencing and then we have a, a Cisco phone here, which are jumping between three or four different platforms here on one screen, one function, uh, uh, one piece of software, you can access all the communications functions that your business requires. This can be delivered over your mobile phone uh, as an app on your mobile phone or as an app on your uh, PC or on your tablet. So if you just move on very quickly, I just thought the next couple of slides, rather than start talking about functionality and which is all quite boring stuff really, what I said I'd do is I'd just give you a quick couple of case studies of some recent um, deployments. When I say recent, a lot of these have been in the last two weeks, all uh, COVID-19 was really the catalyst for people to, 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 to put us, uh, to, to, 
to, to get solutions in place very, very quickly. However, I will caveat it by saying there's been more and more of a movement towards remote working over the last few years. I think this last um, couple of weeks has really been the catalyst for people to say, do you know what? We can, remote, we can work remotely, we can work remotely effectively. Why are we gonna spend so much time in traffic or why are we gonna spend so much time commuting when we can actually, uh, we, we actually can uh, work remotely? So I think, there's, I, I think there's gonna be a big change after everything settles down again. I think you're gonna have more and more of your workforce demanding to work remotely. But anyway, what I just said, just graphically, I'm trying to, just, uh, trying to show you here on this slide that work air is, my, is our business. And uh, you know, we have a picture of somebody sitting on a beach here and they've got their laptop and they've got their mobile phone. And everything that we do is in the cloud. So I have not spent one cent on cabling. I haven't spent one cent on servers in my business. All we have is Wi-Fi and good broadband connectivity. And once any of my team, so my team at the moment, are there are some people in Bolton, there are some people in Waterford, there's some people in Clare, there's some people in Dublin, there's some people in Meath. And we haven't seen each other for about three weeks physically. But virtually, we're talking to each other every day with video conferencing. <clears throat> but also, it doesn't impact the way any of us work because everything we do is on the cloud. Once we have a laptop or a mobile phone and or both, and we've access to the internet, we can work wherever we are. So if you can see that laptop in the middle, so seeing somebody on the beach here, we're assuming she has internet connectivity. And um, if you look at on the right hand side, I've got eight by eight. That's my communications platform. That's my messaging. That's my video conferencing. That's my phone. And that's all up in the cloud. And um, that's linked into our CRM. So our sales force. So for example, if a customer rings us and uh, that customer is already uh, on Salesforce, what pops up on my screen is, well, here is Joe Bloggs from company ABC Limited and we have an order pending for them. So I can see anywhere in the world where uh, when customers uh, 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 ring us that our Salesforce and our 8 by 8 are linked and that customer's details pops up. Our desktop environment is Microsoft 365. Again, that's all up in the cloud. Our accounts package and you know our, our debtors and our creditor management, et cetera, that's all Sage, that's all up in the cloud. And then our billing platform, because we're a telecoms company with quite complex billing platforms, that's all up in the cloud again. So once any of my people have a laptop, they can just open up the laptop. Once they're connected into broadband, they can work on any of our systems seamlessly. Our customers can contact any, anywhere in the world. They just ring through the office number. We find uh, the 8x8 systems find where we are, and uh, we can work. So that's just kind of graphically give you a, a quick snapshot of what our ecosystem looks like. I'm going to give you four quick case studies, and hopefully uh, some of these case studies might stimulate things that may be relevant for your own business. So if you just want to click on to the next slide uh, again, Eilish. The next one again, sorry, that's, that's four. Thank you, yeah. So here's a, a you're gonna hear from Emer Hannah later on in the week, but just a quick snapshot on how we helped our business. The challenge for her was the Irish government wanted to repatriate 600 people from Australia. And Emer was given the job of, or won the, won the contract to do that. She did a deal with Qatar Airways to get 600 people back from Australia as part of this COVID-19. Now, and did a deal with Qatar Airways. She'll tell you all about that herself during the week. But uh, the, the problem she had was she had two offices, one in Belfast and one in Mead, but 30 people had to work from home. So she was going to get bombarded with calls for people looking to get home, but all her people were home working and they were going to ring through to the main office number. So what, what she did was 30 people, she shipped, broke the, uh, the working day into three shifts, uh, you know, roughly 10 people on each shift. And um, Hannah and Travel were an existing customer, but literally all we set up the platform for her, or sorry, we set up the system for her in one hour remotely, where her, her, her team brought home their laptops, brought home the, the apps on their mobile phones, and they were able to work as though they were in the office. Um, and we sent, uh, you know, whatever calls came through to the office, they were sent out to 30 different people in 30 different locations at, uh, in their own homes. But as far as customers were concerned, it was a seamless experience. Uh, we also enabled uh, our help to set up a payment platform in about five hours so she could take payments across. And that was uh, a company called Ecom 365 did that for us. But anyway, the upshot of this was Emer filled all the seats between Friday evening and lunchtime on a Saturday. And that was working through the night and everybody working from at home. Because imagine working through the night, people from Australia were ringing. Uh, they were ringing during their office hours, if you like. So that was something where we enabled a seamless experience. Everybody's able to work from home. And it literally took an hour to get it set up. If you want to move on, Irish, to the next slide, please. 
Intelligo Software, these guys provide payroll services for large corporates, including, like I said, the AA, Deloitte, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, Aviva. And we got a phone call on a Thursday. These were, new, these were not existing customers, but we had been speaking before about the benefits of cloud communications and remote working and disaster recovery, et cetera. We got a phone call from, them from last Thursday week to say, you know, uh, this COVID-19, our, our show must go on. Um, we need to get 60 people out of the office working from at home, but we still have to answer payroll inquiries from Deloitte and GlaxoSmith and Aviva and all the other big corporate customers that they had. So in five days from receiving the order to getting them up and running with 60 people working from, from home, um, that took us five days, uh, again, on the 8 by 8 platform. And that enabled, again, you know, if you were in Aviva and you had a payroll query, you rang the number that you always rang, and that got you through to the people who you normally dealt with, even though those people were at home. But from a customer's point of view, it was a seamless experience um, set up within five days. And um, if you want to move on, Eilish, the next one. Whitney Moore, well-established legal firm there in town. Now, again, these guys were existing customers. I'm going to be a mixture of existing and new customers. Whitney Moore, uh, and, and they were one of the first, they're a law firm. They were one of the first companies to close office and, and get everybody remote working. And they needed 70 employees to work from home. And literally all they did was they brought their laptops home because we had, uh, you know, the, the, the 8x8 platform, the software is on their laptop. They brought it home used their home broadband and everybody was up and running the next day. Literally as simple as that. They went home one evening and they were up and running in their offices, or sorry, in their homes the next morning. The phone system obviously worked with the receptionist was, was in her home. All the calls came into reception. She was answering the calls as normal. And, you know, if somebody was looking for, you know, ABC, the managing partner or whatever, she transferred the call to extension 100 or whatever it was, 101, as she would normally in her office. And that call was transferred to the managing partner in his home and he could pick it up either on his mobile phone or he could pick it up on his, uh, on, 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 on his um, uh, laptop. And uh, there was absolutely, an, it was invisible to clients. It was in a seamless experience to clients. The clients rang in as normal. They rang the main number as normal and the calls were distributed as normal as though they would be. The only difference, instead of the call landing at somebody's desk in their office, it landed at their desk in their home environment. So that was Whitney Moore. If you want to move on to the next one, this is probably the most exciting one that we've done. It's Let's Get Checked. These guys, uh, they provide home testing for a number of different medical ailments, but they have developed a COVID-19 home testing kit. And the, it has just been approved by the HSE and also by the Department of Health in the USA. And the first tranche of, um, uh, of tests were for healthcare workers to enable them to self-test when they got home from work. So obviously, you know, all, all healthcare workers are, are, are worried uh, naturally uh, about their own health. Um, but rather than clog up the systems, if you like, going, going into the systems that they work in, they were able to go home and self-test themselves. But then the HSE and the Department of Health also have approved Let's Get Checked to provide these tests to uh, consumers. So, you know, obviously from a Let's Get Check point of view, that, that, that was fabulous news. But the problem was, the problem that they had was that they're about to release this to the public. They've released it to healthcare workers. They need to have people on the phones to either A, take the orders, or B, they do also provide uh, telephony support, medical support for people who do, uh, who do take these tests. But they had two offices, one in Dunleary and one in New York, both of them closed. They'd just been awarded this, this, uh, this contract or the, the approval. They needed to get 100 people up and running in their homes in a contact center. And we deployed that within 10 days for them across two offices, one in New York and one in, um, in Dunleary. So again, people ring into them, they ring in and they're going to get through to their own team, but all their own team are home working, remote working. They're able to work from home. They're able to do whatever they need to do. And again, we were able to deploy that uh, in under 10 days. That was 100 across two locations. There's another 150 that we've got to deploy over the next kind of 10 days or so. So again, that just gives you the power of the cloud and the power of being able to remotely uh, enable all these things. So if you, if you just want to move on to the next um, cloud. Uh, so there were kind of four case studies, uh, or five, I suppose, if you include our own ecostructure. So I just thought telling a few stories about how we've enabled people to work remotely might just trigger some uh, some things in your own heads that are relevant to your own businesses about uh, maybe that could help us or, or, or whatever. 
The other area that we've come up against, or, uh, sorry, that we've come across recently is obviously board meetings. There's, there's a huge amount of board meetings going on at the moment about, you know, I, I sit on a number of boards at the moment and, um, you know, the, the two items of the agenda are safety, number one, which is the safety of staff and customers, and then cash, number two, and cash being, you know, cash management to make sure that we get through this crisis and what we have to do to, 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 to ensure the survival of the business. But of course, the board can't meet face to face anymore. Um, however, one of the key uh, areas for a board meeting is safety, or uh, sorry, is security. Like you don't want people being able to tap into your board meetings. And there have been, there, there are other products out there. You've probably seen some high profile cases where um, uh, board meetings and even a cabinet meeting in the UK was hacked into when they were using a remote, uh, remote platform. Um, and again, that's down to the security of the particular systems. So if you just want to move on again, Eilish. Um, so just a couple of them, uh, no coincidence, I sit in a few of these boards, but uh, board meetings that did happen last week, Capron, Penergy, Credit Exchange, uh, and, and Free Now, everything operated on the 8x8 platform last month. But the question that the chair of each of these businesses asked me before, uh, before we agreed to, 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 to do the board meeting was, um, what about security? Are we going to get hacked? Is this going to be secure? Can, you know, everybody takes for granted that you can screen share, that you can instant message, that you can, you know, you can see each other, et cetera. But security is something that uh, the question is, is happening. So if you just want to click on to the next slide there, Alish. Uh, we are eight by eight are cloud compliant when it comes to security. I'm not going to go through all these uh, accreditation that they have there. Some of you may recognize them, but the two things that I would say is the Department of Homeland Security in the US use eight by eight as a video uh, conferencing platform. And also the Ministry of Justice um, in the UK use the eight by eight platform. Probably a shame that the cabinet didn't use the eight by eight platform as well. But that's just to give you a, a bit of security about the cloud and, and, uh, and how you can enable uh, sensitive meetings in a secure fashion. So we just want to move on to the next slide. So as Nick said there earlier on that uh, we do, there, there is a free video meetings. There's, there's only three clicks to get an eight by eight video meeting up and running. There's kind of seven for Zoom and there's 12 for, for, for other competitors. So it's, it, it's pretty easy to set up. Um, it's also, it's unlimited in terms of the number of people you want to use on it. And it's also unlimited in terms of the amount of time that you, that you, that you have on it. But apologies now that that's there. Uh, but if you want to see how to access the free meetings, log, log into www.workair.ie. Um, which is down the bottom. Sorry, we should have used a different color there because it's too blended into the background. But uh, if you can access that through our website on www.workair.ie, it tells you how to access the free video meetings. You don't have to register for anything. You don't have to sign anything. You don't have to, down, you, you don't have to download any apps. It all works through your browser. You just need the latest version of Chrome and uh, obviously a good broadband connectivity. And uh, you don't have to be 8 by 8 customers. You don't have to sign up for anything. It's just uh, please use it and please share it. It's, it. it's one of the things that we've launched here as part of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, even though it's been launched uh, by 8 by 8 since November, we only really launched it in Ireland for the COVID-19 crisis. But please use it. It's secure, it's unlimited, and it's free. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so that's me, Don. Again, you can contact if you need any questions about the last two presentations i said i just did a couple of case studies rather than try and go through everything that we can enable and um, but please uh, email us at stephen m at workair.ie is mine bill k is one of my fellow directors at workair.ie or sales at workair.ie or go on to our website www.workair.ie and uh, we'll, we'll certainly get back to you with uh, if you have any questions or you've got anything that uh, uh, you may want to know about the last um, the last uh, hour or so's presentation. Please uh, reach out to us or reach out to uh, uh, Eilish and the team there in Griffith or in Ismi. Thank you. I hope you found that useful. That's wonderful, Stephen. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think really good insights and really good practical tips for everybody as we um, adjust to this new environment. Um, just before I introduce our next speaker, Catherine, there is a poll on the um, on this Zoom webinar. So if the participants that are watching or joining us via Zoom, if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment as I set up Catherine's slides to complete that poll. Um, I realize today's experience is a little impersonal because we're bringing you four, um, I suppose, keynote talks on, on key issues. However, over the next few days, we are going to be reaching out to all of our participants and everyone who has signed up. Um, in order to, to engage with you more and to bring resources that are specific to your business 
and to the needs that you have at this moment in time. So the, the programme and the schedule of events is going to be um, updated and is going to be adapted and resources are going to be provided based on what you tell us you need. Um, so please do complete that poll so we have a better idea of, um, of who you are. And also, as we said, keep the, the questions coming on Q&A. So our next um, speaker is Catherine Moroni, Head of Business Banking at AIB. And we're absolutely delighted to have Catherine here to talk us through um, some of the key issues in relation to banking reliefs. Um, and I am gonna set up your presentation now, Catherine, just a moment. Thanks, Eilish. Um, good morning, everybody. And, and while, while Eilish is doing that, Maybe similarly, I'll just mention, um, as well as being the head of business banking in AIB Bank, I'm also the president of Dublin Chamber this year for 2020. Um, an unusual year to take up that chain, um, still um, critical for us all to do our piece. I'm also the chair of AIB Corporate Finance, and I sit on a number of boards and mentorship programs for businesses, and um, particularly uh, family-owned businesses. So, uh, Thank you, first of all, to Neil and Ismi and to Michael and Griffith College and all of your teams, because this is a super way to, to engage and to reach out and, and share. Um, and to the former speakers, it's, it's great to hear that. So I hope you're all staying well at this time while we respond to this global health pandemic, both personally and in our business. And I do want to say that while, I, while we know the number one priority is to keep our employees and our customers safe, we also, as we deliver essential needs to them, we also recognize that after health and well-being, the flow of cash flow, as already mentioned, and the flow of finance for the survival of businesses is an essential national priority. So I'm going to cover over the course of this part of the webinar, the specific COVID supports that are available from AIB and also some of the key government supports available to business at a high level. But I do want to say that several of the banks here in Ireland are providing very similar supports to those that I'm going to talk you through. So if you are banking elsewhere, most of the information I'm going to cover should be useful to you. Um, I will also cover cash flow management, um, which is probably the most important things for business right now. And just suggest some key areas for you to focus on, just practical areas to focus on to help conserve the cash flow in your business and keep that flowing. I can tell you that the most requested business support we have been asked for to date is for payment breaks. And many of you have already organized and received payment breaks for your business. And there are many more who are in that process right now. So I will just very briefly talk you through how to access that. And maybe just for your insight, the highest demand we've had to date for those payment breaks are sectors such as hospitality, tourism and leisure, Although there's a full mix of sectors in there too, seeking those three month payment breaks across all other sectors. So I am mainly speaking here about small to medium sized businesses because I understand that is the audience this morning. And um, if we move to the first slide there now, Eilish, please. I'm going to start with that three month payment break. And that's there to support your business if you already have, or you expect your business cash flow to drop temporarily as a result of COVID-19 and you believe you'll be unable to make your loan repayments in the immediate future. So that is available there um, to, to give you that facility to just take a break. And it means you're not paying either interest or capital. That's a frequent question. So you can have the payment break for both interest and capital on your loan during that period. And when the break expires, your monthly repayments will be spread over the remaining term of your loan to ensure your loan is repaid within its original term. Now I say that because a frequent question from our business customers, and um, it's more or less the same in most of the banks, they will ask understandably, can I add those three months on to the end of my loan and make my loan for longer rather than spreading it out over my existing loan? And the reason it's being done that way at the moment is, it means you don't have to enter into new documentation and sign new facility letters either online or elsewhere and relook at your whole package that you have so it's a much more efficient way of doing that for this moment in time. And it facilitates a faster turnaround and it means we can get through more customers and provide more of them that facility as quickly as possible. So that's why that's being done that way. And you can see there, the, there's a call me back option. If you, we are aware by the way, that so many customers are looking for this at the moment. 
There are time delays when you ring through trying to get through on that dedicated phone line. That phone line number there is dedicated to people looking for that three month payment break. And then the call back option means that you're in a queue and you will get that payment. You will be able to speak to us and we will provide you with that service when we get back to you. So we, we, we also know with regard to that, that not just payment breaks, but also working capital, which is the second main bullet there, is another big area for businesses at the moment. And I'm not going to go through the detail of these. These are just up here as prompts. Most banks, again, have either got these facilities or facilities very like them. And the purpose of putting them up there is just to prompt you that there's various different ways of dealing with your working capital needs right now. And I've listed some of them there. And the mechanism for applying for these facilities or an increase in them if you need an increase is the normal way that you would do that. So you don't have to ring that dedicated phone line. You can walk into a branch, you can ring the direct phone lines, you can execute a lot of them online. Um, and that's just to give you that option to go with working capital or indeed both. Some customers are taking both a payment break and they're taking the working capital solutions. And just if you have a pen handy, this might be helpful for you also to know what sort of questions are you going to be asked when you ring in and what information will you, will you need. And this process has been simplified both for the payment break and for working capital solutions at this point in time. Nonetheless, when you're on the phone, you will be asked the question, has your business been impacted by COVID-19? Now that might sound unusual, but different businesses have been impacted in very different ways. And then the second question is, in what way have you been impacted? So some customers, it may be their sales, it may be their cost of sales, it may be access to their staff. And as you answer those questions, we'll be able to help you then in terms of, well, what do you need? Is it the payment break? Is it an overdraft? Is it something more structured like a prompt pay? And that's to help with that. And we'll help you with that decision when you're speaking to us. There's certain information requirements we will also need. And again, we're keeping those very straightforward. Your last set of audited accounts are required. Most of you have those with us already. If you've been speaking to us in the last 12 to 18 months about facilities, then we probably have those. We just have them to hand in case you may have to just talk through a few high level things on those. And we'll also ask you about your tax compliance and your up-to-date statement of affairs. But if you're on the phone to our direct banking, you can do all of that online. So you can do it while speaking to us, just to keep the writing piece of this to a minimum. We can accept the information by email as well at this point in time when you're chatting through this. So trying to be as flexible as possible. And so just to summarize then really quickly, the, the, the first question you'll be asked is, are you impacted by COVID? How are you impacted? And what do you need? And we help you with that decision in terms of which product is best for you. And then be ready to provide or to talk through your last set of annual accounts that you're tax compliant and the status of your statement of affairs. I just want to mention as well the business current account fees. AIB will shortly be able to facilitate the deferral of the quarterly maintenance and transaction fees, which were charged to your business account on the 30th of March. And the way you can do that, if your cash flow has been negatively impacted, um, you can apply to reverse the quarterly fees charged to your business account in March. And instead, again, you can spread them over three quarters in September, October, November. The other two areas I want to mention to you, particularly, there are certain businesses that are pivoting right now and are doing different things. And we're even seeing this in the health sector where businesses who traditionally weren't involved, for example, in the provision of PPE equipment are doing that now. And so without going through them again in detail, just be very conscious. If you're importing or exporting from a new country, and particularly if you're doing so in a foreign currency, it is important to protect your business around that. I'll give you an example. We had a customer who was doing this recently, and they were importing from China for the first time. And they rang us looking for an overdraft, which would have been fine. But in the discussion, it became very clear that they were going to be exposed to the delivery of goods into their business through Hong Kong. And what we suggested and worked with them on was a letter of credit instead. So that's a trade finance solution. And the very simple reason for that is that that letter of credit meant they were protected until they knew those goods were shipped. And you can do those in different ways without getting into the detail. If you're 
if you're actually paying a supplier, you can even have a bank guarantee in behind that to guarantee the payment once you supply. So that's really important, just if you are dealing in a foreign currency or if you're dealing with a new country, to think about that and talk to your bank, whoever your bank is. And also very, very briefly to mention to you that if you're exposed to foreign exchange currency right now, and that's a new experience for you, or even if it's one you've been taking for a while, just with the volatility in exchange rates, the first thing to do to try and avoid any foreign exchange costs at all is to say to yourself, well, can I invoice in euro, for example, or receive in euro? And then the second thing is, for example, if you're paying in sterling or dollars, can you bill in sterling or dollars? So that way you're matching your inflow and your outflow and you're not paying anyone for the currency cost. And then finally, if that's not possible, then to put some foreign exchange protection in place with your bank. So at least when you lock in the price that you're selling for or that you're buying in your supply for, you've locked in your profit margin or your costs. And that's really important because as we all know, the foreign exchange movement there can just wipe out the whole profit for you or your expected cost on your business. And then very briefly, I've just put up the contact number for the merchant services. Again, a lot of businesses are dealing online for the first time. So those merchant service supports can be really helpful in terms of receiving and paying for your goods in very, very um, cost-effective and easeful ways. So there's a, there's a contact there for that as well. So we might move to the next slide where I'll just briefly deal with the government supports for businesses, and then I'm going to move on to the cash flow piece. So I'm going to start with the SBCI Brexit loan and COVID-19 working capital scheme. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I do think it's really important for businesses to know that there are all sorts of supports out there. And the most important thing for businesses right now is to keep the cash flow going through their business. If you can do that through this pandemic, you will bring your business out the other end of it because you already know you have a successful viable business. You've been trading already. So all of these supports are designated here are around helping you trade through this. So that first box there, just very briefly, that is really the Brexit loan scheme repurposed to help for COVID. And those facilities can be for a period of one to three years. So that helps spread it out. And it can be for an amount up to one and a half million. And also, if, you, if you're doing up to 500,000, that can be unsecured. The first step in that, and this is really important, is to go to the SBCI and get an eligibility code because their first question will be, and our first question to you is, are you eligible to use this? And one of the key eligibility codes for COVID-19 is that your tur turnover or your profits have been negatively impacted by COVID by up to 15%. And there are also innovation criteria there, but it's really important to say to you that those innovation criteria have been broadened. So even if you've looked at them in the past, have another look at them online. They're deliberately made more broad to facilitate people who are being impacted by COVID-19. So that would be well worth your while looking at that. Um, and the funding is available all the way up to March, 2021. They need a simplified business plan. I'm going to talk about cash flow in a moment, and that's really the critical thing, what's happening in your business from that perspective. And finally, getting that eligibility code is the first piece of that. And then that credit guarantee scheme, the second box there, we currently facilitate, by the way, we provide that SBCI facility through our bank, as do many other banks, once you come in with your eligibility code. And likewise, with the credit guarantee scheme, that one um, is designed to facilitate customers with loans that can be secured by the government guarantee. And for the moment, an interest-only repayment on existing loans is also available through that. So that might be helpful for businesses who already have that facility in place or require that interest-only facility. It's also available where there's inadequate collateral. And also, if you have a novel business or technology which is perceived to be higher risk, the credit guarantee scheme can be really helpful there. Again, go online and look at the specifics there. Again, it can be for facilities up to a million, anything from 10,000 to a million, and that can be for a term of seven years. So seven years can be really helpful to a business, particularly at the moment when they're trying to take that long-term view. 
and they know where their business will go once they're in the recovery period. And it can be used for term loans and demand loans and performance bonds. And then thirdly, I'll mention Microfinance Ireland. There's a COVID business loan from Microfinance Ireland. It used to be for 30,000 and it's now up to 50,000. So even if you have one of those already, it may be possible for you to avail of an extra 20,000 euro there. And it's provided in partnership with the enterprise offices. Again, it's government funded and it's designed for micro enterprises that are having difficulty either accessing bank finance or that may be impacted again by COVID-19. Again, the up to 15% rule applies there. And it's for up to 50,000. And a micro enterprise is a business that employs less than 10 employees, which is most businesses in Ireland. And with a turnover of up to 2 million, then you qualify um, more, more likely than not for that microfinance support. Their terms are for up to three years and it can have six months interest-free also. And there are no additional fees or arrangement fees. The uh, interest rate on the microfinance vary from 6.8 to 7.8%. And I should have mentioned um, on the SBCI, it's 4%. And finally, I mentioned some of the supports available to Enterprise Ireland. There are quite a few, so I would encourage you to have a look at their, their site. But they've just launched a 200 million Euro EU support scheme for businesses to assist during COVID-19. So those details are being finalized at the moment. That's worth looking at. But they also have things like grants, just to mention a really practical one for businesses seeking to organize their financial planning at this time. So that's worth looking at. And all of those, it's worth saying, the state aid rules apply. So if you've already availed of state aid, you just need to make sure you're still within the parameters of that. And now I'm going to move to the cash flow management. I can't stress enough that this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say to you this morning. Businesses at this time, it's the cash flow more than anything that will get your business through this period. Obviously, health and well-being is first and primary, and we all recognize that. And I say that to you because we find quite a lot of businesses are saying to us, but I don't have any cash flow right now. Why would I be doing a cash flow statement? And the first thing I'd say to you is the reason you do a cash flow statement is for yourselves. It's not for the bank. And even where there is cash flow tightness, you need to focus on the other side of the balance sheet. So you may or may not have revenue coming in right now. You may have debtors you're trying to work through, but managing the other side, every cost, including fixed and variable costs, is up for negotiation right now. So the starting point there where you see the number one on the left-hand side is your business bank account. Wherever your bank account is, determine what your working capital is right now, even if that's a deficit. And then ask yourself, line by line, what is every single cash flow need I'm going to need in the next week, in the next few weeks, and if you can, out for the next six months, because... The reason I say that to you, I know it's really uncertain, but just giving yourself that trajectory where you're specific day by day right now, but you also can see where you're going over the next six months. And the six months will also help you with those bills that you have, like rent and rates, et cetera, that mightn't come in on a weekly basis, but will come in over those six months and keep it as a rolling forecast. And then what I would say to you is that on that second segment there is, Look at your payroll, look at your PRSI, look at your VAT, look at your suppliers, look at your debt repayments. Prepare your cash flow statement and ask yourself on every single one of those lines, do I have to pay that? There are very good online supports there. We have one on our website called the AIB Small Business Cash Flow Planner. Whether you use that one or not, anyone that you look at will give you all the line by line details and prompt you on those questions you need to ask. And it is worth your while doing that. Just start for yourself. And just sit down and, and work through that on a daily and weekly basis. And what I would say to you is remember that all of those revenues and costs are up for your consideration on how you can do them differently right now. So, for example, if I move down to the third quadrant, if you have debtors, some of them might be prepared to pay you early, they might actually be prepared to do that for a discount and it might suit them because some businesses are still quite cash flow rich or have cash on their balance sheet. 
So don't forget to talk to your debtors and see can you get some of that revenue in early. It may be worth their while. Speaking to your suppliers, obviously you want to respect your suppliers, you want them to stay in business. Anything you do there, you want to do by agreement. But there are some suppliers into you that may be willing to take a deferral of payment. Um, your banks are a very good example of that where those three month deferrals or the extension of your working capital to help you trade through this. And that's why they will want to see that cash flow and your figures with you because they'll want to know that you're on top of it. Nobody has an issue with the business having a cash flow challenge at any time, but particularly now, as long as there's a good conversation between you and what you expect it to be and what you don't expect it to be so that you can work as partners and work through that. That's really important. And it's okay to say where you're 100% certain and where you're not and to allow for contingencies around that because this is, this is all about keeping your business going during this stage. And then very briefly ask yourself, if you already have sufficient stocks and supplies, maybe change your purchase spend, maybe extend that a little and just make all of that work, sweat it all out and make it work for you. And again, those government schemes I mentioned to you, ask yourself, can you use them? And then finally, what I would say to you in that fourth segment over there on the bottom, um, I think it's the left-hand side of your screen too, talk to your connections. Some of us use that commute time to speak to your bank, to your financial advisors, to your local county council, to your member organizations like your local chambers and your trade associations. They're really keen to assist you. I've been on a few webinars myself. For example, the Dublin Chamber have had a few. Members have been really willing to come in to Zoom meetings very like this and share what's going on in their sector. And that can spark ideas for you. They're doing different things around their cash flow. They're also doing different things around their delivery chains. You've heard a bit about the well-being piece this morning and different technologies that are available to you. The simpler you can keep that, the better the more you can focus on your core business. So I would just encourage you to have as many um, uh, conversations there as you possibly can at the moment. And then I might just go on to our final slide there, Eilish, thank you so much. Just giving you our customer contact numbers there, just to help you with your contacts. And all banks, at the moment, if you go online, all financial services, in fact, most businesses have a COVID section that will help you. Just briefly, there is that to request a payment, payment breaker for further information in the top left. That special dedicated phone line for you if you want that three month payment break. And to remind you, all of our branches are still open. The phone lines are open. You can still apply online. And go look at all of those government schemes. And the most important thing I think for all of us is to keep talking really the most important thing is we're all here to collaborate and support each other and there's no such thing as an already answered question there's absolutely no problem talking about anything you need to know with us or indeed any of your suppliers at this time so thank you very much and mind yourselves thank you catherine um i'll leave again that slide just up i will be sharing this on our website but just in case anybody is taking something down right now. I won't stop the share for just a moment. I think Catherine and, and the upcoming talk from Naomi in particular um, are, are, are areas that people are full of questions um, in relation to both government supports and, and working with your bank. So again, as I mentioned earlier, I know that this is kind of a, a, a more formatted approach, but please, please do put in your questions for um, Catherine or for Naomi, who's coming up next. Um, and indeed for, for Nick and Stephen from earlier on, please do put them in the Q&A section. Um, and Michael, my colleague who's co-coordinating this program is, is monitoring that, he's taking note of all the questions. And myself and Michael will be sitting down with all of the panelists from today, over the next day or two, to catch up with them and to get your queries answered. And we will make that available as an online resource. So please don't be shy, please do ask questions. Um, our final speaker today is Naomi Butler, who is Head of Tax Compliance at KSI Faulkner Orr. And Naomi has um, the, the lovely task of explaining or making sense um, in, in practical terms um, the government supports that are available for small businesses. So thank you, Naomi, for taking the time to come in. I'm going to just set up your presentation now and it will take just a moment if you'd like to come on camera. 
Hello. Um, okay, there, there we go. Yes, yeah, I'm on. Right. Sorry, first time doing this. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm head of tax compliance at KSI Full Canard. Been there for 16 years, and um, I would like to say though, well done to Revenue on this. They have really been on the ball in getting this set up quite quickly for people, and they've redistributed their uh, team to answer queries, prioritise, get refunds out where refunds are due and have put stops on other issues like revenue orders, investigations. So there's lots out there for people at the moment um, to get involved with revenue, to ease cash flow worries and give themselves a peace of mind. So um, we'll get back now on the slides. Maybe. Um, so I'll just give you a, a brief guide so far with revenue. So revenue have asked that all returns are still filed by their due date. So keep your paperwork going in. 23rd day for all of your VAT, corporation tax, payroll returns, get them going in. You don't have to pay them now. So don't worry. So Eilish, next, next slide. Thank you. Eilish goes to the next. Yeah. So. You don't have to pay them now, but you do have to file them. So keep your paperwork up to date. And that will also help you with the banks then because it's going to show that you are being tax compliant, your tax affairs are in order. So make sure if you're not making payments, you tick the button that says file returns only. Uh, Revenue are prioritizing anyone that's got refunds coming out now. So they have advised that they won't be enforcing any non-payments for the next three months. And they've suspended audits and compliance intervention activity as well. So, you know, this gives them time to relax, take a breather. On a side note, your LPT deductions, and local property tax deductions that were due to take place on the 21st of March, will now not be debited until the 21st of May. This happened automatically. And if you want to pay it sooner, you can go back into your LPT and you can pay it sooner. But revenue have automatically transferred this across. Um, if key personnel are unable to get the paperwork in for you, they have, Revenue have advised that they will accept best estimate basis while you try and get yourselves organized. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so for some of you there, if you make interim claims for professional service withholding tax, like your F45s, Revenue will accept these submissions via my inquiries. Normally, they'd only ever accept them by post. So if you've got a good scanner, get them scanned in, and use them to my inquiries, get them into your tax agent or your accountant if they do it for you normally. Again, scan into them, they'll scan them into revenue. So all your returns must be up to date. So if you are a December 2019 year end and you want to get an interim refund for 2020, your 2019 corporation tax return is going to have to go in. Um, also, if anyone is availing of the R&D tax credits, Revenue again have said that they will be expediting any payments that you are due this year for those again. Again, it's all done through my inquiries. Um, so then next slide, Eilish. Um, for debt management, so they have suspended all collections to the debt management. Any interest for late payment of taxes for your VAT and your PYE liabilities for this year so far are being suspended. So you do have time to get the money together to pay these. They are advising that if you're having difficulties in paying any total taxes, to contact them on their phone number or through your normal contacts or through my inquiries. If you have faced payment applications in place or PPAs, you can get deferments for up to six months there also. So revenue are very much trying to minimize the cash flow out of you so you can keep your business operating as much as possible. And now the big one, um, Eilish, next slide, is payroll. Okay, so this is the one that's caused the biggest uh, issue for people because you don't want to be letting staff go. The thought of trying to let staff go and then trying to rehire them later on is not appealing. So revenue introduced a temporary wage subsidy scheme for a period of 12 weeks, which commenced last week, last Thursday. It's open to all employers who keep employees, including salaried directors who are on the payroll through the COVID-19 pandemic. 
the uh, employers have been encouraged to facilitate employees by operation of the scheme, keeping employees on their books, making efforts to maintain a significant or 100% of the net income of the employee for this scheme. However, you should ensure that you don't pay your employees more than, they, the, than what they would normally take home as if this crisis hadn't taken place. Uh, you don't have to top up the wages, but revenue hope that you kind of would. You run it through your normal payroll process. So if you've got a payroll provider, they will be able to take care of this for you. And the reimbursement from revenue is pretty much happening within two working days after the payroll submission. So if you time this right, you have very little impact on your cash flow. You are supposed to make a payroll submission to revenue on or before the day you pay the employees. And you can do it up to four days before you do to pay the employees. So if you pay the employees on the Friday, make a submission on the Tuesday, the funds should be back in your account on the Thursday, you pay the employees on the Friday. There should be no hiccups in your cash flow. Uh, next slide, Eilish. So who can avail? So this is for every sector. There's no sector left out except for public service and non-commercial semi-state sectors. So majority of retailers, manufacturing, anybody else can apply for this. I mean, I can't stress it does include salary directors. Um, it's operating on a, set, a base of self-assessment and honesty. You need to be able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of revenue a 25% decline in turnover. This is a decline in turnover across the whole business operation, not just a particular department. You need to be experiencing significant economic disruption due to COVID-19. And you should be able to pay, be unable to pay normal wages and normal outgoings fully. As um, the lady before me was mentioning, you pair cash flow chart. Instead of having wages at the top, have wages at the bottom. Get rid of all the other debts first. So the bank loans, the rent, the insurance, the rates, whatever can't be deferred, go through those first and then see how much money have you got left over to pay the wages. You must retain your employees on the payroll. Not every employee is the one that you're going to apply this for. And the employees don't have to be working from home and don't have to be put on effectively garden leave either. And it's for all payrolls, so be it full-time or part-time employees as well. The employees must have been on the payroll by 29th of February. So if you hired somebody on the 2nd of March, they won't qualify for this scheme. Um, okay, so next, thank you. And um, so, okay, this to register is very, very simple. It's either done by the employer if the employer has access to Ross, or your payroll operator, your tax advisor, or your accountant. You log into Ross, you go on to my inquiries, revenue already have the template set up for you. You click on the category of COVID 19 temporary wage subsidy, just read through the declaration and sign it. You don't need to sign it, you just submit it. Revenue then sends you back an email in about a half an hour saying, that's great, make sure you've got your bank account set up that we can issue the refunds straight into your bank account. And they will send you a reminder email as well to ensure that you have this done. Um, so, sorry, next slide, thank you. Okay, so there's a lot of information on this slide, but this is basically the basics. So on the subsidy payment, at this time, you don't apply income tax, peer aside, or USC. Employer peer aside doesn't apply either, and it doesn't apply as a top of payment. Um, but on the top of payment, the employee will be liable to income tax in USC. So you need to regross the payment. So for example, if you have 100 euros, revenue are giving you 70% or 70 euros, 70%. You don't operate anything on that. On the 30%, you need to regross that to take account of any POAE and USC that will be due on that to bring the employee down to the 100. And employers, here aside, of 0.5% applies on any of the top of payments. So the employers are making a saving here of between 8 to 11%, depending on the here aside class that's in place. You need to note as well that not every employee will qualify for subsidy from revenue. If the average, the net weekly wage is less than 586, 
the amount of revenue will subsidize is 410 or 70%, whichever is the lower. If the employee's net wage is between 586 and 960, the maximum subsidy is 350. And if the employee earns a net wage of more than 960 euro, there is no subsidy. The net wage is taken as being the gross wage for USC purposes, less POIE, less PRSI, less USC. And at the end of the year, revenue have advised that they will do a review. So the employees, depending on their salary cutoff point in tax credits, could owe revenue some month on this subsidy payment. The subsidy payment is not tax-free money. It will be taxable at the end of the year. Revenue have advised that if you were to operate on a cumulative basis, the payroll is normal as you would normally operate it. A refund could be due to the employees of USC and PYE. What we are suggesting is instead of operating the payroll during this period on a cumulative basis, you do it on a week one, month one basis, which basically means you look at the payroll as it stands by itself for this particular payroll period, ignoring what happened previously. This means effectively that the employees will have money in the bank with revenue and that the, hopefully if there's any taxes due at the end of the year to be minimal. And in a better scenario, the employees will actually be due a refund, which at the end of the year could be very welcome. This is something you should discuss with the employees before you operate to decide which would they prefer, a cumulative basis or a week one, month one basis. In relation to BIKs and notional pay, you can suspend them for operation at the moment. Revenue have issued some very good guidelines on it. However, again, at the end of the year, there will be a review, so there could be a clawback of taxes. Each payroll and each employee on your payroll is different. So regardless of the fact that they might all be paid the same amount, depending on their individual circumstances, their bottom line could be different. So you need to look at each employee separately, okay? And um, on the next slide, um, submissions can't be backdated. So if you've, and you can't amend a submission that has a J9 PRSI class. It's very important that you include, you change the PRSI class from an A or an S to a J9. Otherwise, you don't get the refund or the subsidies from revenue. Okay? You are obliged to show the subsidy on the employee's A slip, and the employees will still get uh, stamps as such. So they will get credits while operating the J9. This scheme is only open to employers who file through Ross. My understanding is there's only a handful of employees who do paper returns anyway. There's no restriction to the age restriction to the employees. So if you've got over 70s working on your job, then they can still, uh, you can still apply for this with them. Um, in relation to employees who might be getting additional support from the Department of Social Protection, such as the standard X's and O's that some people are referred to it as, or other uh, short-term work agreements, get those employees to contact their local welfare office to ensure that they don't get benefits on the double. They will be clawed back. And for anyone who's self-employed or a non salary director, as a director who's not on the payroll for their company, they'll need to contact the department directly and apply for the COVID-19 pandemic unemployment payment scheme. If they weren't on the payroll by the end of February, they can't go through the payroll now for this scheme. Um, got a few through that. Sorry, that is everything there on it. Um, thank you very much. Um, if you've any queries or that, there's my contact details on it. I will say stay talking to revenue on any matters you have, talk to your advisors, talk to your accountants, talk to your bank, talk to your landlords. Just stay talking to everybody about your cash flows and to try and keep the businesses running. The purpose of this payroll scheme is to make set up when all of this is over that you can go back open your doors, keep your doors partially open now. And when this is over, you'll be able to open fully with your staff there ready and willing to get cracking on everything. Uh, thank you very much.
That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, I think for both yourself and Catherine, like I said, dealing with quite complicated and complex issues. Um, so great to hear it in, in layman's terms. And I understand from my colleague, Michael, who's moderating the chat, that there are plenty of questions for you. So we're going to have a great old chat and chinwag over a coffee um, tomorrow or the next day and work our way through those questions. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Naomi. Okay, so that brings to an end our four keynote speakers. Um, I, I'd just like to finish up um, by thanking you all for participating today. Uh, those of you who are here on the Zoom webinar and those of you who are joining us on YouTube. Um, I'd like to say a special thank you to all of our speakers um, who gave such clear, useful, practical and relevant information for the here and now. Um, just to let you know, the format for the rest of the webinars is slightly different. Um, we, we viewed today's as almost day zero in terms of grounding you in the here and now and, and things that we felt were particularly relevant for, um, for businesses in, in the present time. Um, but some of the upcoming webinars do change their focus to having a more future focus too. Um, so what we, the format you will see on Wednesday and Thursday of this week and on the following Monday, Wednesday and Thursday and into the following week too, is just two key speakers. So you will have one keynote speaker um, coming in to talk on a particular topic. The full list of topics is up on the website griffith.ie and you will see um, on the front page there the link to our course. Um, so all of the speakers are there. So we'll have one keynote and then we'll have a, a more practical facilitated session, kind of a deep dive into particular areas um, spanning marketing, accounting, finance. So many of the things that were touched on today by our speakers, so looking at them in more detail. Please do keep the questions coming in. Myself and Michael Bosnay are coordinating this course, so we will be in touch with you um, and available to you throughout the coming four weeks. If you go onto the website griffith.ie and go to the course page, again, you will find all of the resources there, but you will also find our contact emails and in the case of me, a phone number, should you need to get in touch. So please don't hesitate if you have any issues or anything in particular you would like to see covered. Um, the purpose of these webinars is to help you. So we welcome feedback at all stages. Um, so please do share your feedback with us from today's session and in terms of what you would like to see in future sessions. So thank you very much. All of the resources from today, the notes and the slides um, will be made available on the website. Give us about a 24 hour turnaround to do that, please. Um, and similarly, the recording of this webinar will be available on our website too. So you will be able to revisit um, and, and look back over the key information you received today. Thank you very much for your time. Like I said, any, any questions or queries at any stage, please do get in contact with us. Um, and thank you for joining us today. I look forward to seeing you all again on Wednesday morning. Please stay well and be safe.